Our guest for this week's Touch Basins Hole works in the field of cancer research. He teaches quantum physics, but he's also a science fiction writer as well. He's in fact the author of Mickey Seven, a novel which has been picked up to be made into a movie with Oscar-winning Korean director Bong Joon-ho at the helm. It's also now been translated into Korean and published here in July. I'm delighted to say that we have the author Edward Ashton joining us via video now to tell us more about his work. Mr. Ashton, hello and welcome to the show. Hello and thank you very much for speaking with me tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's exciting to have you with us. I gave a quick summary about all the things you do in the introduction, but it is your work as a science fiction writer that we'll be talking about. Uh, you are a scientist by training, I understand, though, with a degree in electrical engineering. But then what led you to write science fiction? I was a writer before I was a scientist. Uh, I started writing when I was you know, barely old enough to read. I wrote my first sort of set of short stories when I was about four or five years old. My father actually moved house a few years ago and, and sent me a folder full of things that I wrote when I was a very small child. Wow. Uh, I saw my first professional story when I was 18 years old. Uh, I've been publishing ever since. So the, this being, being an actual scientist uh, obviously has been very helpful and informative to my, to my writing as a science fiction writer, um, but it, it really uh, has been an add-on as far as my career has has progressed because, as I said, I, I was I was a writer first. Right. So uh, writing was your original passion. Uh, you started working in cancer research and imaging, I understand. You also teach quantum physics to grad students. So first, are you some sort of genius? And secondly, uh, how do you find the time to do all this? I mean, it sounds like you're living three lives. Uh, you raise a family as well. Uh, I, I like to think I'm efficient. Uh, in, in the way that I operate. Um, I, I, I've, I've gotten that question about how particularly I managed to fit writing into my life uh, a lot of times. And actually, I, I published an essay on that topic a couple of years ago, the title of which was Writing in the Interstices. Um, I, I have found that it's much easier as a writer if you don't, at least for me, force yourself or have this idea that you have to have perfect conditions to write. You have to have three hours where you can sit down and have perfect silence and everyone leaves you alone. That's never going to work for somebody, certainly with with the life that I lead. Um, so my first novel was written essentially with a sandwich in one hand while I was eating lunch at work um, over, over the course of about eight months. Uh, even now when I'm writing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working on a novel right now. If I'm making something for dinner, I'll, I'll put it on to, to cook and I have 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, I can write about 200 words. Uh, and if you put in 200 words here and 300 words there, uh, you add up to a 100,000 word novel surprisingly quickly. So that's that's how I work. I don't, I don't write in extended stretches. I write during the times that my life allows me to do it. And I've found that that's, you know, that's been enough, at least so far. Right. You make it sound easy, but I don't think there are many people who can do what you do. It is uh, pretty incredible. Uh, let's talk about Mickey Seven, your latest work that has generated a lot of buzz, of course, since it was announced that it was going to be made into a film. Can you briefly tell us what it's about? Sure. Uh, the, the very short description is that Mickey Seven is a book about a man whose job is to die. Uh, it's a book that is set about a thousand years in our future, the premise is that during this time we've developed technology that allows the recording of your personality, uh, your, your mind, everything about you, uh, and the creation of clone bodies, which those personalities that your mind can be transferred into, um, which is you know, in, in some ways a form of immortality. And then of course, being a being an author and therefore being a sadist, I thought, what is the most horrible thing that we could do with a technology like this? And I came up with the concept of the expendable, uh, which is what the, the, the job that the protagonist of this book has. This is someone who uh, on space colonization missions, which are extremely dangerous endeavors, is required to do all the most difficult, all the most dangerous jobs because he has the ability to be recorded and backed up and, and reinstantiated every time he dies. Hmm. Uh, and 
when he first starts this, it seems like a good idea. It seems like a good way to get away from his home world. Uh, he learns fairly quickly that this was not actually the best idea he ever had. But by the time he figures that out, it's much too late to back out. And things really just sort of spiral down for him from there. Right. So it's uh, about clones, to put it simply as well, exploring, I guess, what it means to be a person, whether it's th their skin and bones or whether it's their memories or whether it's both or something in between. What inspired you to write this story? I've, I've actually always, even from a very young age, been interested in a philosophical problem um, that people have been chewing over since the mid 1700s uh, called the teletransportation paradox. And put in its simplest form, this is simply the question of if you could do what I just described, if you could record all your hopes, your dreams, your hatred of strawberry ice cream and your love of electronic dance music, transfer that to a new body, would that new body be you? Or would it just be another person getting his grubby hands all over your stuff? Um, when this problem was first posed, of course, it was entirely uh, a, a thought exercise. Hmm. People today are taking this very seriously. Ray Kurzweil at Google is very serious about doing this. I mean, the man takes 200 supplement pills a day in an effort to live long enough for the technology to catch up to the point where he could record his mind. And he believes that would give him a form of immortality. Um, I, I question that even as a, as a kid watching Star Trek and looking at the transporter beam, which is supposed to be moving a person from one place to another, mm. but quite obviously was dissolving one person and creating a new person on the other end. Um, it, it raised the question for me, what is the subjective experience of that person who is stepping on that transporter? Is, is he really finding himself at the other end of the beam or is, is he just dead? And my suspicion is that probably he's just dead. No one else can see the difference between him and the person who came out the other end. But from a subjective standpoint, he knows he's not here anymore. Uh, and, and that question, that, that really is a central question of my protagonist's life, Mickey. Sure. So it's a brilliant exploration of a classic sort of uh, sci-fi setup, exploring some very interesting ideas. Uh, so in retrospect, I guess it's perhaps no surprise that it has been picked up for a movie. Let's talk more about this adaptation now. It was actually announced even before the book was published in February this year. Uh, how did that happen? It, it was a very interesting uh, sort of turn of events. The, uh, the option for, for the book being sold to the movie theater um, or to the movie production company actually occurred in January of 2020. So it's, it's, it was before the book was even contracted to be published. Um, as far as how that occurred, uh, the only thing I can say is that my agent, Paul Lucas, is brilliant. Uh, somehow he got the manuscript into the hands of Jeremy Kleiner and, and Brad Pitt at Plan B uh, productions and they they liked it. They liked the manuscript. They thought it would make a good uh, film, and they picked up the option. Now, of course, studios option fifty properties for every one that they actually produce. So mm -hmm. it, it never occurred to me that, that this would actually turn into a film. Uh, but then in January of this year, I was sitting at my breakfast table, and my wife was sitting across the table from me, and my phone dinged. I had a text. It was from my agent. It just had a link. It said, you might want to click on this. I thought, well, <laughs> this is a phishing attack, obviously. I'm going to click on this, and it's going to ransomware my phone. Um, but I did, and it was a link to the announcement that director Bong was, was taking this on as his next project, and Robert Pattinson was starring. My wife looked at me across the table, and the first thing she said was, oh, my God, who died? Because apparently I my face just went completely <laughs> pale. And, um but, uh, you know, I, I explained to her nobody was dead. It was a good thing. And, and uh, you know, things have sort of snowballed from there. Was director Bong the kind of director you would have uh, thought of for this book? Uh, you know, we, when Jeremy Kleiner first contacted me about this a, after the option was picked up back in 2020, he stated at that time, that he thought that director Bong was the only person who could really do this project justice. Uh, and, and I think I agree. I'm having, having spoken now with director Bong uh, about some of his philosophies. Um, I think he and I are very much on the same page with a lot of the things that interest us uh, in terms of 
uh, class conflict. You see that a lot in, in his work in, in, term, in, in Okja and in Parasite and, and Snowpiercer. Um, he sees obviously very interested in some of those same things, which, which are present in Mickey seven, the, the idea that Mickey is drawn from the lower classes. He's the only one on this expedition who is sort of an ordinary person. Everyone else is the elite of the elites and he's forced to do all their dirty work for them. Uh, I think those themes resonate with some of director Bong's other works. Uh, and also the sort of absurd humor that you see in some places in parasite. You also find that in some of my work. Uh, so I, I think there's just a really good philosophical uh, fit between what he finds interesting and what I find interesting. So I think it, I think it is a good match. So it sounds like you've had some extensive conversations with uh, director Bong, that it wasn't uh, just a conversation where you were giving him your blessing to make the film, but uh, he perhaps picked your brain a bit as well on, the, on some of the ideas in the book. Yeah, we actually spoke for about two hours. It was... Uh, a really amazing conversation. Um, he knew my book better than I did at that point, <laughs> which just Im impressed me to no end because obviously, you know, when you go through the editing process, I have reread this book literally hundreds of times and he picked out details that I had forgotten about. Um, he asked me about things that I hadn't even considered. He asked me, for instance, you know, there, there are these creatures called creepers, which are sort of the, in some ways, the antagonists in the book. He asked me how they reproduce. And that was something that I had not given the least thought to. <laughs> he, he when he asked me that. Um, and there were a number of other things that he went into that I had to really dig deep to, to try to, to try to figure out what an answer to, to those questions would be. So um, as I said, I was, I was just so thoroughly impressed with how well he knew the material and, and how much he had thought about it. And, and at that point, um, if I had had any doubts about whether he was the perfect person to do this, uh, they, they were certainly elate at that point. So has there been regular contact since the initial conversation? Or would you say the book and the movie are on perhaps different paths now? Uh, no, that, that was the only conversation that I've had with, with Director Bong. Um, I've had some further interactions with the folks at Plan B, just keeping me in touch with what's going on in, in terms of scheduling. Uh, but one of the things that he said to me, made very clear to me, and I fully understand this, um, is that the movie is one thing and the book is another thing. They're completely different art forms, um, even if they're drawn from the same material. Uh, as he put it, I wrote a 350 page novel. He's writing 120 page scripts uh, and these, they, they can't be the same just in terms of the content and in terms of the way things are presented visually on the screen uh, versus what you can put in the written word. They, they have to be different. And so he's, He's gone off on his, and of course, he always puts his own spin on things. If you look at the graphic novel that Snowpiercer was was derived from, the, the movie is quite different. Mm. Um, and so I, I expected that that would be the case. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, I'm really excited to see what he's able to do with the work. Sure. Uh, it, I'm sure you must be excited to see uh, how he puts his own interpretation and spin on things for the final product then. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Uh, we also mentioned at the start that the Korean translation of Mickey 7 has now been published here in Korea as well. Uh, do you hope readers in Korea uh, take anything away uh, differently from uh, perhaps what you uh, might have expected originally when you first released the book in English? Um, I, I had a few sort of messages that I really wanted to get across with this book. Um, as I said, there's a little bit of a, a, a philosophical underpinning to the work. Um, but I did not write it as a philosophy text. And there's a little bit of science mixed in there. I did not write it as a physics text. What I wanted to write was a fast paced, entertaining book, something that would be fun to read. Uh, and I hope that that translates well to Korean. It's, it's being translated now into, I believe, 21 different languages. I'm very hopeful that all of those editions uh, are able to convey the, the, the same things that I tried to convey in the English in the English edition. Well, congratulations on the Korean edition and uh, the movie and the book as well. Have you uh, been to Korea before? Uh, I have been to Seoul once right. in, in my uh, capacity as a, as a scientist. One of the things that I do is um, 
we run international clinical trials. And so we, we work with sites all around the world. Uh, and so I've, I've, I've worked with uh, a couple of sites in Seoul as, as well as uh, other places in, in Asia. Well, I think now that the Korean translation is out and that uh, a movie is being made with a Korean director, it's time that you return to uh, Korea as well, perhaps with director Bong as your tour guide. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. We've been speaking to Edward Ashton, author of Mickey Seven. Thank you for your time once again. Thank you. I really appreciate it.